Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Sebastian from Naturalism Next, and this is the Why I'm an Atheist series. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the first couple videos in the series already, this is a set of videos where I outline my reasons for being an atheist, where I give a comprehensive case for atheism. Now, in the first three parts of this series, I first introduced the methodological principles that would undergird the rest of a series, and I gave a number of arguments for atheism in the form of pieces of evidence that I think are much more probable if naturalism is true uh, than if theism is true, much more probable to obtain if naturalism is true than if theism is true, and therefore constitute significant evidence against the truth of theism. So I would highly recommend checking those videos out first before watching this video, just because they sort of give a sense of how a series is going and explain the general argumentative structure uh, that the series takes on. Now, in this part of the series, what I'm going to be doing is look at the evidence that's taken to favor theism. So recall that when you're trying to compare two hypotheses, you can't only look at the evidence that supports one hypothesis, right? You have to look at the total evidence and then weigh the evidence and see whether the evidence in favor of one hypothesis is stronger than the evidence in favor of another hypothesis. So the series would be incomplete if I only gave arguments for atheism and then I ignored all the arguments for theism. So my intention in this part of the series is to look at the arguments that, that favor theism and then basically come to the conclusion in the end that the evidence favoring naturalism is stronger than the evidence that favors theism. So that's what we're going to be doing in this video. Now, two quick notes before I get into that. First of all, thank you all for your patience. I know this one took longer to get out than the first three parts uh, of the series. That's for two reasons. First of all, I had already pre-written the slides for those first three parts, whereas I needed to write these slides in addition to record the video associated with these slides for this part. And secondly, and more importantly, I have been working on this big project responding to the psychophysical harmony arguments for theism, which is this new argument that's gone popular in apologetic spheres. Some of you probably haven't heard of it, but that has just recently been released on my blog in collaboration with a few other people. So I would highly recommend checking that out if you have interest in that argument. And actually serves as a nice supplement to this part of the, the series because I'm not covering the psychophysical harmony argument in this part of a series because I started writing up uh, the blog posts that these videos are based on before that argument had even sort of come out. So for those of you interested in my thoughts on that argument, please check out the blog post below. Uh, second note, I want to thank the Real Atheology team, which is a set of people who are interested in the analytic philosophy of religion from a naturalistic perspective. I'm friends with a few of them, and the reason I'm thanking them is because one of them, who was really enjoying the series, was nice enough to volunteer to help sort of tune up the aesthetic quality of my slides. I'd just sort of been focusing on the content, not the aesthetic so much, but he was willing to come in and help out and make the slides look a lot nicer. So you'll notice that we have a bit of an aesthetic glow up for this part of the series. So thank you again uh, to that member of Relay Theology for the help with that. So without further ado, let's get started. So to introduce theistic evidence, the first thing I should say is that I'm not one of these atheists who says that there's no evidence for theism. Uh, I, I think of evidence in a very weak sense. I think of evidence in the sense that I talk about in the first video, which is that something is evidence for a hypothesis if it would be more likely to obtain on that hypothesis relative to competitor hypotheses. And in that sense, I think that there are facts that are more likely to obtain antecedently if theism is true than if naturalism is true. So my strategy isn't going to be to say that there's no evidence for theism or that theism just can't uh, be an explanation at all. Uh, instead, I'm going to argue that the evidential uh, weight favors naturalism. That, that the, in other words, the arguments that favor naturalism are significantly stronger than those that favor theism. And I'm going to explain why in this part of the series. But because that's sort of a, a vague aim, I'm actually going to be a bit more specific and show that theistic evidence suffers from two distinct problems that don't as problematically afflict naturalistic evidence. And I'm going to start by outlining what those two problems are. And then as we go through all the pieces of evidence that are taken to favor theism, will return to these two problems and see whether uh, these problems apply to that particular piece of evidence. And I think what I hope you'll see is that this is, this is, these are problems that really are, are present throughout a lot of theistic evidence. So let's get started with by outlining those problems. So general problems with theistic evidence. So the first problem is disputed data. And what I mean here is that theists often appeal to the existence of data that are highly disputable. In other words, they uh, appeal to facts that I'm not even sure obtain, and it's not clear we can plausibly count as being a consensus thing that obtains. Uh, now, if we aren't as confident that something really exists, it obviously can't count as strongly towards our final tally. Right? As an analogy, if you were a, a murder investigator and you could place one suspect at the scene of a crime with 100% uh, confidence, 
uh, but another suspect of a scene of a crime with only 70% confidence, well, then obviously your credence that the first suspect is the murderer should be higher than your credence that the second suspect is the murderer, just in virtue of the fact that you're more certain that that first suspect was there at the crime scene when the thing happened. Analogously, I think that uh, when it comes to the evidence favoring naturalism, we can be more certain that this actually is evidence, but this actually exists relative to the evidence that favors theism. And again, this will make sense once we go into the evidence that's taken to favor theism. Uh, the second big problem with theistic evidence that I want to highlight here is, under, is this idea of the fallacy of understated evidence. And this is something that was uh, sort of coined or pointed out by Paul Draper, uh, philosopher Paul Draper. And the idea here is this, this fallacy occurs when a theist identifies some general fact G that fits better with theism than naturalism, while ignoring more specific facts about that general fact that fit better with naturalism than theism. So let me start by giving an analogy before I explain how it works in the context of this series. So imagine again that you are a, a detective and you're investigating a, a murder and you find a body and the body has many, many deep stab wounds all across it. And you're trying to figure out who, who committed this uh, murder. And suppose your assistant brings along a suspect and they say, it turns out, uh, detective, that the suspect actually had a knife on them. Now, obviously that initial general fact that you hear that they have a knife should increase your credence that they're the murderer probably very substantially, right? Because the, that, that, that murder weapon matches the wounds that you saw. But now suppose that you, you search them more thoroughly and you find that indeed they do have a knife on them, but it's actually a plastic knife, right? It looks more like this knife on the left and this knife on the right. Well, that more specific fact significantly dents the evidential impact of that general fact, right? Once we learn that it's a plastic knife, then it looks a lot less compelling because a plastic knife couldn't have made those kind of deep stab wounds. And that's the sort of analog I want to draw to theistic evidence. I think that uh, theistic evidence looks the most strong when you state it very generally and you don't get into specifics. When you just appeal to intelligibility and consciousness and orderliness, uh, then you can sort of, I think, get some kind of evidence in favor of theism. But the second that you look at the specifics of this evidence, when you, when you get, get away from general facts and into specific facts, I think that the evidence strongly favors naturalism. So I think theism is highly parasitic on these general facts. And the problem with that is that the specifics are highly relevant to the evidential uh, weight and effect of these facts. So, okay, that's the second problem I want to bring up. And I, I hope you'll see how we'll obviously get in depth into how this problem manifests itself in all sorts of arguments in favor of theism as we go through uh, these pieces of evidence that are taken to favor of theism. So, I think that's enough about the general problems that afflict theistic evidence, and now we can actually get into the first piece of evidence that's taken to favor theism. So the first evidence I'm going to cover uh, are basically cosmological arguments from contingency. Another way you can put this is the sort of the existence of necessary things. So what, what even is this argument, uh, for those of you who don't know what this is? So this argument is... It takes on many, many shapes and sizes. I shouldn't really call it an argument. Uh, there are many, many different kinds of cosmological arguments. But I'm going to be focusing on what I think the strongest version is. I think the strongest version of cosmological arguments uh, are contingency arguments. And basically the way these work, and again, there are different kinds of contingency arguments even, so uh, I'm being a bit, uh, I'm summarizing a bit here, but I think I, I'm being fair to the general spirit behind these arguments. And, and that's that these, these arguments generally have three kinds of steps. The first is to establish a kind of explanatory principle. Uh, the most common one being uh, the principle of sufficient reason or some sort of modification to it. And this is the idea, generally, that all contingent facts have explanations. So if something's, if something's a contingent fact, if it could have been otherwise, then it has an explanation. Uh, secondly, you establish that there's some kind of global state of things that needs explaining. So, for example, uh, classically, this was thought of in terms of the big... Uh, conjunctive contingent fact, which is basically a collection of all contingent facts. And you say, look, this big global state of affairs, like this, this set of contingent facts or the natural universe, this itself needs an explanation too. Then you establish that the explanation for that thing lies in a necessary being with particular properties that point towards it being the omni-god as opposed to being something natural. So uh, here's just one example from Alexander Proust, who's been a big proponent of these kinds of arguments. So premise one, every contingent fact is an explanation. So there's that first step with the principle of sufficient reason. Secondly, there is a contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. There's that second step, establishing that global state of things that needs explaining. Thirdly, uh, therefore, there is an explanation of this fact. And then uh, fourth and fifth, this explanation must involve a necessary being. This necessary being is God. So there's that, that last step about establishing that uh, there is, this explanation lies in a necessary being that has certain properties. So, okay, that's the kind of argument I'm addressing. But uh, one thing I want to note here is that the series is using an abductive framework. 
So I, I'm not going to be treating this argument as a deductive argument uh, for the existence of God, because I don't think that that's a plausible route for trying to figure out whether naturalism or theism is more uh, probable to be true. Uh, those are thoughts left best left for a different video. Uh, but the way I'm going to be thinking about this kind of argument then is I'm going to be treating the idea that a necessary thing exists as a piece of data and then asking, look, uh, or stating the argument as theism better explains slash fits with the existence of a necessary being than naturalism. Or we could state it as theism better explains the existence of a contingent natural universe than naturalism. So that's the sense in which I'm thinking uh, about this argument in the context of this series. Uh, now, the way that my response is going to go is I'm going to start out by assuming that contingency arguments successfully demonstrate the existence of a necessary being. So I'll be treating a necessary being as data at the very beginning. And I'm going to look at whether this really does fit better with uh, theism than naturalism. But then later, I'm going to come back and challenge whether these arguments even work at establishing a necessary being to begin with. Um, so in other words, I'm going to say that this argument relies on disputed data. So let's start with, by, with what I said first there and look at whether or not the necessary being is God, right? Let's assume a necessary being exists. Should we think that that's God? Is, is that something that fits better with theism than naturalism? Well, there's many, many ways to make this argument, but I'm going to focus just on uh, one, and it's maybe the most popular one I want to say nowadays. Uh, and, and basically, this is an argument from limits. The way this argument goes roughly is, look, if something is limited, then it has an explanation, right? So if you have some arbitrary physical constant or value or parameter or something like 3.14, take that as an example, it's the value of pi, um, you can always ask, well, why did that why did that parameter take on that numerical value as opposed to some other numerical value? It looks very arbitrary, unexplained. Um, therefore, things that lack limits, like a, a omnipotent, uh, omniscient, morally perfect God, are better candidates for necessity than things with limits. Um, so that's the general structure this argument takes on. It's been, it's been most recently popularized by Joshua Rasmussen, so you can look him up if you want more details. But this argument actually goes way back. Uh, Richard Swinburne, basically, in a different context, made a very similar argument uh, at the beginning of the existence of God as well. Um, so the idea is that these, these unlimited foundations uh, have some, some kind of virtue and explanation relative to these limited foundations. <clears throat> okay, so that's the argument. Um, what, what do I think of it? Well, I have four general criticisms of this kind of argument. First of all, I think that the problem cuts both ways, especially for sectarian theists, right? So sectarian theists, the Christians, think that God is trying in nature. In other words, that there's three instantiations of God because there's a trinity. Uh, and three seems to be a very arbitrary, num limited number. Right? Why are there three instantiations rather than two or four or five? Um, also, why is there only one God as opposed to many gods? What about a polytheistic foundation with, with many gods, even unlimited or infinite gods? This, again, seems like it lacks limits in the sense that a single god does not. Or what about a some sort of foundation that just produces infinitely many gods? Uh, so when you apply the standard consistently, it's just not clear to me what, what theory it cuts out for. Does it best cut out cut in favor of sectarian theism? I don't actually think it does. Secondly, there are countervailing considerations for thinking that limited explanations are preferable. So here I'm not trying to undercut uh, this argument. I'm just trying to show that our intuitions are a bit muddy about these kind of matters and that I think they're kind of unreliable. So uh, to, to explain what I mean here, consider that an unlimited being has far more causal power than is necessary to create the universe. Right? Uh, an omnipotent being uh, has much more power than they need to create the natural universe. Now, compare that to some natural mechanism that has just enough causal power to produce its effect. Right? All, the, only, the only power it has is just the causal power it needs to produce the limited natural universe. Now, intuitively to me, the fact that it has just enough causal power rather than causal power far in excess of what it needs makes it more virtuous. Um, again, I don't think this undercuts the argument, but I just think our intuitions about uh, what is or is not a virtuous candidate for explaining cont the contingent universe are, are very muddy um, and, and not something that should be relied on significantly. Thirdly, naturalism seems condition, uh, excuse me, naturalism seems consistent with a foundation that does lack limits. Uh, uh, an omnipotent god is not the only kind of thing that can lack limits. So imagine that the initial state lacks spatial or temporal boundaries but it just doesn't have any moral properties. Well, that's a totally uh, natural initial state, um, but it seems unlimited in the sense that uh, it, it lacks things like spatial or temporal boundaries. So I think there are ways to formulate naturalistic foundations that don't have limits. Fourthly, uh, it's not clear to me that this is actually a good way to think about necessary things, right? Because necessary things must be the way that they are. That's the whole point of something being necessary. So it looks incorrect to say, well, why does this necessary thing have X value rather than Y value? Um, 
because it must have that thing. So the idea that a necessary thing has an arbitrary limit looks mistaken. It must have had the value that it had. Therefore, it's not at all clear that this framework actually properly applies to necessary things. Um, because none of the properties that necessary things have are relevantly arbitrary. They must be the way that they are. So those are my general criticisms of the argument from limits. Again, I think it's an interesting argument. I'm not totally opposed to the idea that a necessary thing might fit better with theism, but I don't think that this argument is, is very, very strong or, or counts as significant evidence in favor of theism. Okay, so next we get to the core of my problem with this argument. Um, so, so really, my, my actually bigger problem with uh, contingency arguments is that they rely on disputed data. Right? They, they rely on the idea that there is this uh, necessary thing that exists that explains the contingent natural universe. Um, I don't accept that such a thing does actually exist. Um, so in other words, I doubt those initial steps you need to get to that point. Um, and many, if not most, philosophers disagree that there is a necessary being. And like I said, I myself am skeptical that, they, that these arguments establish that there is one. <clears throat> so I'm going to challenge two premises in these arguments. Uh, the, the sort of these initial the initial stages of these arguments. First of all, I'm skeptical of the kind of principle of sufficient reason that's necessary to motivate the cosmological argument. So I'm going to examine three arguments for it, and then I'm going to provide reasons to doubt those arguments, and then present two arguments against it. Secondly, I'm skeptical of the idea that a sufficient explanation of some set slash conjunction of things, for instance, an infinite regress, would require an explanation of uh, the regress itself, as an example. So remember that second part of contingency arguments is to establish that there's this big global set or uh, state of affairs that needs explaining within a necessary thing. I'm skeptical of forming that set uh, in general. Uh, that'll make more sense when we talk about it later on. Uh, but let's start with this first part uh, of my skepticism, the, the principle of sufficient reason. Okay, so let's examine three arguments that are given in, in support of the PSR and see how well they fare. So the first argument, and I kind of want to say that this seems like the most common one or the most natural one, is that the PSR is highly intuitive and it receives considerable inductive support from our everyday experience, right? It certainly seems intuitively like things have explanations. And in fact, it seems inductively like all sorts of all, all the time within our daily lives and in science, we're constantly seeking out explanations for things and finding explanations for things. Uh, in, in my opinion, this is the best argument for the PSR. I, I agree in general that we ought to accept inductive evidence. However, I think there's still reason to doubt this rationale, specifically when it comes to this strong kind of PSR. Uh, and that's because we have reason to doubt that we should extrapolate this intuition to the place that the proponent of the cosmological argument needs to go with it, namely the origin of the very origin of natural reality itself. And this is because we know that our folk understanding of the world breaks down when you get to states very far removed from our local reference frame. Right? There are countless examples of this, things like relativity, relativity, time, quantum mechanics. Right? We have all sorts of local intuitions about the structure of things that turn out to, to be completely backwards when we get to the fundamental nature of things. And this is more true uh, the more fundamental you go. And what can be more fundamental than the very origin of the natural universe itself? Uh, so. Uh, our inductive evidence, in other words, is undercut by the fact that we have strong reason to think that our, our folk understanding of things is not going to apply when you get down to the deepest uh, level of the mechanisms of the universe. Uh, secondly, this evidence is neutral between various versions of the PSR, right? I could use this evidence to support a different version of the PSR that's completely consistent with naturalism. And only certain versions of the PSR are going to get you to this necessary thing that you need for the contingency argument. Uh, so that's the second problem with this uh, kind of argument for the PSR. So again, I think this is the best argument for the PSR, but I don't think it's, it is overwhelmingly compelling. Um, okay, I already, already explained that response. Okay, second argument. Uh, you could say science either relies on or provides support for the PSR. Uh, well, I've already sort of examined the latter version of this claim. Uh, I already explained this idea that, or I responded to this idea that there's a lot of inductive evidence for the PSR. I acknowledge it's the best argument for the PSR, but there's still reasons to doubt it. But the former version that says, look, science relies on the PSR, I think is, is far too strong. It seems to me that the way that the practice of science goes is that scientists look for explanations as far as they can. Right? They look for explanations, and then eventually they often will bottom out in natural laws. But they don't assume that they're, they're always going to find explanations. In fact, they're, they're often happy to bottom out in these sort of facts about nature, these, these constants or, or laws of nature that they, they don't then further dig into. So it's not clear to me that our everyday practice of science relies on a PSR. There are also reasons to think that our normal understanding of causation and explanation is not actually even concordant with science. In other words, science there, there are reasons to think that science challenges our folk understanding of the way that uh, explanation works. I'm not going to significantly get into that, but for people interested, I believe uh, Sean Carroll and Hartree Field have done some interesting writing on this, so 
feel free to check that out. I'll link it below. So yeah, I think this, this second argument uh, either doesn't work or it's basically a version of the first argument. Uh, the third argument, and this is a, sort of an interesting one, is that denying the PSR entails untenable skepticism, and therefore we should accept the PSR because we don't want to be uh, untenable skeptics. So the general rough idea here is, look, suppose it were possible <clears throat> that natural facts could exist without explanations. Well, then it's possible that the current state of the universe had no cause at all, and so our present experiences, including all our thoughts and our memories, uh, are uncaused uh, and, and completely illusory, right? So, uh, so it, it's possible that my present experience right now uh, just had no cause. But if that were true, this would seem to undermine the warrants for our beliefs, right? We have to have a proper causal relation between the cause of our beliefs and our actual beliefs to have a warrant for them. That's the idea here. Now, the obvious response you'd want to give to this argument is that there are lots of reasons to think that our thoughts are not uncaused, right? Uh, it seems like the overwhelming appearance of things is that this is the case, right, that our thoughts aren't uncaused. It seems like there's lots of evidence from history and, and science that shows that there's a history of, of, of thoughts and memories in my experience. Uh, you can appeal to various epistemological principles like phenomenal conservatism, which is the idea of it, like if science seems the case, then that's prima facie warrants for me thinking that it is the case, and it seems like my thoughts aren't uncaused. You can appeal to theories of knowledge like coherentism and say, look, the idea that my thoughts are not uncaused fits better with the general web uh, beliefs that I have. It's a more virtuous web compared to some web on which my, my thoughts and therefore my beliefs are are uncaused. But the problem with this kind of response is that uh, the advocate of this argument can just turn around and say, look, this is totally question begging uh, because you've already needed to assume that your present experience has caused to use these counters, right? The second that you appeal to something like your memory, well, your memory uh, draws on you having a uh, past experience of things, which is precisely what's in question is whether or not you have a past experience of things or whether or not your belief uh, that you have it is just something that was spontaneously formed just now. So that's the, the sort of response the advocate of this argument is going to want to give is that this is a question begging counter. Uh, now, the wh what do I want to say? My, my problem with that kind of uh, counter is that this is the nature of responses to skeptical scenarios. So the whole point of skeptical challenges is, is that they're designed such that the data is consistent with both hypotheses, and they're intended to undermine any judgment of probability one might make. Uh, so as an example, suppose that I come to you one day and I say, look, you got hit on, on the head with a rock. And so unfortunately, everything that you think right now, your, your perceptual knowledge, uh, your intellectual knowledge is all, uh, it, it can't be trusted. Nothing you say really is reliable anymore. Now, suppose that you happen to actually have CCTV footage, like you have a, a video of the time period in which I allege that you got hit in the head with a rock, and it shows that you never were hit in the head with a rock. Well, if you show that to me, I can still say, look, uh, look, I already told you, your perceptual faculties and your faculties, your intellectual faculties have been undermined. So nothing that you say or look at or show me is going to be, uh, is going to, to work here because uh, you the, the, precisely what, what's in question here is whether or not your ability to analyze these things is functioning properly right now. And so what are you supposed to do at that point? You can't do anything. The whole point of skeptical challenges is they're meant to get us into these muddy scenarios. So same thing with brain and the bat scenarios, right? It's always the case that, uh, you know, I, I can make a brain and the bat scenario consistent with everything that you're seeing. I can make it so that there's some scientist stimulating you to hear me say this and to see that and to do this. Um, and so, so this is the, the nature of skeptical scenarios. The, the most famous response to skepticism, which is the Morian shift, uh, which is a, an argument given by G.E. Moore, which is basically, look, um, I, have ha I have one hand, I have another hand, and therefore I'm not a brain in a vat, therefore skepticism, you know, external world skepticism is false. It's, it's, it's a question begging demonstration, right? Because the idea that you have hands is itself what's called in the question by these skeptical brain of that type scenarios. But G.E. Moore's point was that, look, this, this, prem this premise that I have hands is always more plausible than the premise that the skeptic provides. Um, and therefore, we ought to prefer this premise that we have hands. Now, you might not find that compelling. Um, most gen philosophers generally regard it as a, a good response to skepticism. But my point is that this isn't uniquely a problem for naturalists. Uh, how to deal with skeptical scenarios, being able to fit all the data, is something that everyone has to deal with, uh, irrespective of one stance on the PSR. We can design skeptical problems that will create this issue for people who agree with the PSR or who don't agree with the PSR or who are theists or who are naturalists. We're all going to have to try to find a way to respond and that response very likely is going to look question begging to the skeptic. Now, importantly, I'm not trying to refute skeptical challenges here, right? I actually think the skeptical challenges have more, more thorns than people uh, make them out to have. But insofar as the standard strategies to refute them work, things like the Morian shift, I think they can be used to undermine 
uh, this argument. It's not clear to me that the naturalist has unique problems compared to the theist. Okay, so that is the that that was the argument, last argument I'm examining in favor of the PSR. I'm now going to give two arguments against the PSR. So the first argument I want to give against the PSR is that there are reasonable and coherent naturalistic world pictures on which we ought to reject the kind of strong PSR needed for the cosmological argument. So consider the version of naturalism that says that explanatory reality is exhausted by the natural universe. Right? So all of explanatory reality is contained within the natural universe. Now, the totality of explanatory reality obviously cannot itself have an explanation, right? Because if, it had, if there was an explanation, it would be part of the totality of explanatory reality. And I'm, note I'm assuming here that there is no self-explanation, which is an assumption that you probably are going to want for the contingency argument anyways. Now, on this view, we ought to suppose that the natural universe has no explanation, right? And additionally, we have highly principled reason to suppose that the explanation for natural reality itself or the initial explanatory link in this picture is not explained unlike the rest of the events in the chain. Because in virtue of being the beginning point of all explanatory reality, it must be unexplained. So note here that we're not just arbitrarily saying, oh, this initial link uh, has no explanation unlike everything else uh, just to save naturalism or something like that. No, the point is that uh, since on this view, the natural universe exhausts causal or natural reality, uh, the initial point is special, right? The, the initial point of explanatory reality is uh, unique relative to the rest of explanatory reality in that it's the one thing that, that cannot uh, be explained or, or must be uncaused in a certain sense. So, and note this is exactly the same option that the, the theist has. The theist is going to think the exact same thing. They're just going to extend out explanatory reality to include God or something supernatural. So given the existence of such uh, a co such a kind of coherence naturalistic picture, naturalists have principled reason to reject the kind of PSR necessary for the LCA. So this is not a reason for theists to reject the PSR, but it's a reason to say, look, naturalists have good reasons to reject uh, the kind of PSR that would say the natural universe itself is, is explained. And it seems to me that this is probably how most naturalists think about the universe. They think about the universe as exhausting explanatory reality. And because of that, they have a good reason to think that uh, the natural universe is not going to have an explanation. And so the fact that uh, these uh, plausible and coherent uh, world pictures for naturalists exist means that naturalists have good reason you know, to reject the PSR. So that's the first argument. The second argument is a bit more serious in the sense that it's also going to afflict theists. It's not going to be something that just naturalists uh, can use to reject the PSR. And that's the modal collapse argument. Now, uh, the way this argument works is suppose that we get to our collection of contingent things that needs explaining. So remember that the cosmological argument, uh, the sort of second step is to get to this, this set of things or this collection of things uh, that is contingent and needs an explanation. So whatever that thing may be, whether it's a finite natural universe and an infinite regress, call that thing, call that collection P. Now the question arises, and let me get, let me move forward in the slides to get the, these visual uh, diagrams out to help. Uh, the question arises, what, what explains P? Uh, and here on the right, uh, blue represents contingency and green represents necessity. Now, the explanation can either be contingent or it can be necessary. So if it's contingent, the problem is then it would be part of P. Because remember that P is a collection that contains all contingency, it contains all, all contingent things. So therefore, that's not going to work. So the explanation, uh, so this here won't work. So the explanation must be necessary, right? So suppose Q is the thing that explains P and Q is necessary. The problem is that anything that follows from a necessary thing will itself be necessary. Uh, what's the reason for this? Well, a necessary thing obtains in all possible worlds. So anything that follows from the thing that obtains in all possible worlds will also obtain uh, in all possible worlds. Therefore, P will be necessary too. Uh, but the problem is that if P is necessary, then there are no contingent things, which undermines the very rationale for the cosmological argument to begin with and implies necessitarianism, which is a, a highly implausible uh, doctrine. So. If this were true, if this modal collapse argument worked, then it would undermine the entire basis for the cosmological argument and it would be a sort of disastrous for the PSR. So you're gonna need some way around this modal collapse problem. Now, one kind of response you might wanna to give to try and save the PSR here is to weaken our understanding of explanation such that uh, explanations do not need to entail the thing to be explained. So to go back here, you could say, look, Q is necessary, but it causes P or explains P indeterministically. And that way P only obtains uh, indeterministically, and so it's not also necessary. Now, my problem with this alteration to the PSR is that it seems to me to be tantamount to admitting the brute contingency exists. To see why, it seem, if, we, if we think that there can be indeterministic causation or indeterministic explanation, then you can have two identical universe states um, illustrated by this diagram on the right, and they're completely identical up to this point, but then all of a sudden they diverge into A star and A prime. And so now we're different after this point. 
Uh, but there's absolutely nothing you can point to prior to this point that explains why you got a star up here instead of a prime and vice versa. Uh, there's nothing because they're completely identical. And, and so if you can allow a deterministic causation or explanation, then this scenario is possible. And since a star and a prime are identical prior to their divergence, there's nothing different between uh, a star and a prime that can explain the fact that you get this divergence. And so you're admitting that there's something that there's there's something that's brute here. The fact that we're uh, getting a star from a rather than a prime from a is is a brute fact. Uh, it's it's unexplained. It's it's a brute contingent fact, and that's obviously a problem for advocates of the PSR. So the response you'd want to give to this is to say something like, look. When we say that, uh, and sorry, I switched the notation here. I should have kept it as a star and a prime. Now I'm talking about p and q. So in your head, p and q are now a star and a prime. So when we say that p happened instead of q, what we really mean to say is that p happened and q did not happen. And then we can give a probabilistic explanation of p and then explain not q in virtue of p obtaining. So in other words, to go back here, uh, what you could say is, look, when we explain that a star happened, we explain the fact that a star happened from the fact that there's some indeterministic thing that caused a star here. And then we explain the fact that a prime did not happen in virtue of the fact that a star happened. And that's supposed to sort of respond to this uh, issue with non-entailing explanations. Uh, now, I, my problem with this is that it just pushes back the question. So uh, here I'm quoting Graham Oppie. Uh, the relevant contrastive fact is that from this indeterministic device X, we got P rather than Q, right? From, so, so go back to these diagrams, from some indeterministic device here in the universe, we got P instead of Q. Now, what explains the fact that we got from, from X, from this indeterministic device X, we got P and not Q? Well, well, because X is indeterministic, there can be no sufficient answer. It's just brew. So it seems to me that this doesn't actually, this isn't actually responsive. You're just pushing the question back. Ultimately, there's going to be something brute here. Um, it's just inevitable there'll be something brute because you have you have this divergence and then there's nothing you can point to prior to the, the divergence to explain uh, that divergence. So uh, I reject this uh, counter response. Now, uh, another kind of counter response you'd want to give uh, is to shift to a weaker version of the principle of sufficient reason. So remember that we started out by describing the principle of sufficient reason as all contingent facts require an explanation. But there are many versions of the PSR you can give, some of which are weaker and, and therefore do not require as strong warrant, or at least that's what the advocates of these weaker PSRs would want to say. Uh, yet these weaker PSRs, you can still use them to get to the conclusion of the contingency argument. Um, now, there, there are three things that the weak PSR needs to do, and it's going to be very hard to establish a weak PSR that will do all these things. First of all, it needs to remain strong enough such that it can still get us to the conclusion that there's a necessary being, right? Because you could weaken the PSR so much that it won't actually get you to the conclusion of the contingency argument, and that would be a problem. Second of all, it needs to avoid collapsing back into the strong PSR. A number of versions of the weak PSR are known to have this issue. Actually, when uh, Proust was originally defending the weaker PSR in response to Graham Oppie, Graham Oppie later showed that, in fact, the weaker PSR he was defending ended up just being equivalent to or collapsing back into the strong PSR. Uh, so obviously that won't help because then if it collapses into the strong PSR, then you have the same problems with the strong PSR as you did before. Thirdly, and this is the most important one, it needs to provide us with a principled reason to accept this weakened principle. And this is really important because there's plenty of alternative explanatory or causal principles that the naturalist can accept that will not get the theist of her conclusion. For instance, something like all non-initial items have causes or explanations, or all efficient causes have accompanying material causes, which is something that uh, a line that Philippe Leone has pushed. So yeah, but Theist needs to explain, explain to, to naturalists why should we accept this weakened version of the PSR that you're modifying for the sake of uh, saving this contingency argument as opposed to some other weakened version of the principle of sufficient reason that I can accept as a naturalist. Uh, I've not yet seen any compelling uh, argument for why uh, naturalists ought to accept the Theist's uh, weakened PSR opposed, as opposed to a PSR that would be perfectly uh, good or fit with their current understanding uh, of the world. Okay, so... I don't have time in this video to go through all the different formulations of the weak PSR. Uh, so what I'm going to go go ahead and do instead is link to a blog of a friend of mine who uh, is a really smart guy and actually has a hope a whole post where he goes through Proust's argument or article in the Blackwell Companion and talks about all the different formulations of the PSR that Proust gives in there and basically demonstrates that they're all some combination of ad hoc, implausible, or false in various ways. So. This is a really, really excellent post, basically explaining the idea behind making modifications to a principle and then showing how and why those modifications fail in various ways. Uh, so please check that out in the description. The link is right here. Uh, I, I, 
again, he also he also has a, a really uh, interesting article that I'll also link in the description where he makes a similar argument to Van Inwagen's against the uh, against the PSR. So you can also check that out too. So uh, this post will give you some idea of the general problems that I think exist within uh, weak PSRs. Uh, because again, there's just so many that this video will become too long and it would have to be a, a separate video just about contingency arguments. So I hope that gives you a sense of my problem with contingency arguments uh, when it comes to that, that first premise about the PSR. Uh, I think that there are reasonable reasons to reject the PSR and the arguments in, in favor of the PSR aren't decisive. I should note, I'm not um, someone who is completely 100% confident that the PSR is false. I just don't think that we can treat it as uh, certainly true, which is a problem. Okay, and there's the link to that second post. Okay, so the second response I'm going to give to the contingency argument is based on the Hume Edwards Campbell principle, or at least that's how it's referenced in the literature. And this originates with something that David Hume said about infinite regresses. And I'm going to start by quoting that. So, in such a chain or series of items, each part is caused by the part that preceded it, and causes the one that follows. So, where is the difficulty? But the whole needs a cause, you say. I answer that the uniting of these parts into a whole, like the uniting of several distinct counties into one kingdom or several distinct members into one organic body, is performed merely by an arbitrary act of the mind, and has no influence on the nature of things. If I showed you the particular causes of each individual in a collection of 20 particles of matter, I would think it would be very unreasonable if you then asked me what the cause was of the whole 20. The cause of the whole is sufficiently explained by explaining the cause of the parts. So there are kind of different interpretations you might give to this passage, and this is going to be important for addressing uh, responses to this counterargument. I want to start off by looking at those interpretations. So one way you might interpret what Hume is saying here is, look, there's no more that you need to explain a conjunction than an explanation of each conjunct. So if you have some conjunction of facts, uh, you, if you just explain each conjunct within that conjunction, then you sufficiently explain the conjunction. Alternatively, though, uh, if you look earlier in the passage, what Hume says is that a conjunction is merely an arbitrary uniting of items in the mind. So it's not the sort of thing that needs explaining at all. So it's not like we need to explain the conjunction via uh, an explanation of each conjunct. Rather, if you take a bunch of facts and just smash them together, um, that's a completely arbitrary act. You don't need any explanation for that special set of things you put together at all because it's actually not uh, a special thing whatsoever. Now, a more concessive response you might take because you might think that some conjunctions are uh, actually more than the sum of their parts is this. You might say, look, those conjunctions that are simply arbitrary and do not describe anything beyond the sum of their parts succumb to Hume's principle, while alternatively those that are not arbitrary and do describe something beyond the sum of their parts uh, do not succumb to Hume's principle. So this is going to be important when we address counter uh, responses to this principle. So what's the application of this principle to the contingency argument? Well, suppose, for instance, that the universe were an infinite regress, where each moment is explained by a, the prior moment in time. Well, the whole point of the contingency argument is that you're meant to be able to say, look, well, the regress itself needs an explanation. But if this principle is right, then smashing together all the contingent facts in this regress is just an arbitrary uniting of the mind, for instance. It's not the sort of thing that needs a special explanation. And so uh, it's totally sufficient to just explain each moment in the regress via the prior moment, and you're done at that point. And so that's why this principle is highly relevant to con the contingency argument. It rejects the formation of this global state of affairs that you say needs explaining beyond each individual thing. So before moving on from this uh, objection, I want to talk about what Alexander Proust's response is to it, because he has a rather rigorous paper where he goes uh, through this heat matter worth Campbell principle and tries to uh, give a counterexample to it. And his primary counterexample here is he says, imagine there's a cannon that fires a ball at 11.59. And that ball travels, and it travels, and it travels, and then it lands at 12. Now consider the conjunction of physical states from 11.59 to 12, where that first time 11.59 is non-inclusive. So we're not including the state where the cannon fi itself fires. This is important. We're just talking about the physics of the cannonball right after it fires all the way until it lands. Now, remember, according to the Hume-Edwards-Campbell principle, at least in the way that Cruz is interpreting it, we can have a complete explanation for this conjunction which will, would include the cannonball moving through air and landing without making reference to the cannon. Because remember, this conjunction explicitly is leaving out that in initial state where the cannon fires. Uh, but Proust says this is absurd. Obviously, to explain a cannonball moving through air, you need to reference uh, the cannon. And this is because we can explain each conjunct, a state of the cannonball, in terms of the physics of the ball's previous state. We just talk about the physics of the ball's previous state all the way until 1159 without ever talking about uh, the cannon itself. So Proust says, therefore, this Hume Edwards Campbell principle is false. So my response to this counter from Proust is that Proust is clearly relying on the first interpretation of Hume that we looked at earlier. He's not mentioning the part where Hume says that 
there are certain conjunctions that are just the arbitrary unities of things in our mind and don't actually require special explanations at all. This is often neglected part of the Hume passage. And on this latter interpretation, the question isn't, can we explain the set from 1159 to 12, where 1159 doesn't include the firing of the cannon, with reference to each conjunct alone? Rather, it's, is this conjunction something that is more than the sum of its parts? And arguably, there's reason to think that uh, the cannibal conjunction is something beyond the sum of its parts, so it does require a special explanation. While on the other hand, something like the BCCF or any analog that you'd apply to the universe is not something beyond the sum of its parts. It's something we've simply arbitrarily united in our minds. And it's important to mention that there are clearly conjunctions for which this is the case. So for example, uh, imagine, uh, take, take for example, the little conjunctive dog fact. Uh, now this is a combination of the fact that my dog is hungry and the fact that I want to take my dog on a walk. Now, clearly, I, there's an explanation that, assuming that the PSR is true, for uh, me wanting to take my dog on the walk and the dog being hungry. But then if you ask, well, what's the explanation for the, the conjunction of those two facts that you've just put together? Uh, the answer is, well, you've just sort of put those two facts together in your minds. So there's no clear relation or special explanation you need beyond having just explained uh, each individual conjunct. So, uh, and, and note that it's on the advocate of the LCA to explain why, in the case of the BCCF or the universe, there, that that is something beyond the sum of its parts. Uh, because if we say, well, look, there are some conjunctions that need special explanations and some conjunctions that aren't, it's going to be on the advocate of the LCA to establish why the universe is the kind of conjunction that does need this special kind of explanation. Secondly, even ceding to Proust that the correct interpretation of Hume is that first one, this response seems to trade on the ambiguity between our everyday notion of explanation and then a physical scientific explanation of each state after the ball leaves uh, the cannon. So what do I mean here? What I mean is that to explain each moment in the cannonball's flight, it seems to me that all you need is an explanation of the physics at, of a prior state. It actually isn't clear to me at all that you need to reference the cannon, uh, Proust's incredulity notwithstanding. Uh, now, of course, in an everyday sense, it would seem bizarre to explain the flight of a cannonball without reference to a cannon. But when you carve out a series of time courses into an infinite set of physical states along the path of a cannonball, and then ask for the deterministic explanation of the set in terms of the physics, we should no longer think that the explanation we should would match what we would colloquially, colloquially ask for in an everyday context. Right? It's ridiculous to take our colloquial standards and then apply them to this extremely specific uh, bizarre sort of thing that you've carved out in terms of the physics of the time from 1159 to 12. Uh, and notably, there's a disanalogy between Proust's example and infinite universes as well. We intuitively demand explanations in the case of finite causal sequences, sure enough, but it's not clear that that intuition will continue when it comes to infinite causal sequences. At least the intuition seems to dissipate for me. So I think that this response trades on the ambiguity between our everyday notion of explanation and the scientific kind of explanation that you would want here. And it insists that we should have our everyday notion apply to the scientific notion when I think that's incorrect. And I think that Proust's example is also parasitic on a certain kind of intuition about finite causal sequences that won't apply for infinite causal sequences. Uh, as a, this is not actually a response. I shouldn't have said that it's a response to Proust's argument here, but this is just an aside. So later on in, in this paper that Proust uh, writes, he gives this counter arguments to causal loops and, and to self-explanations. And he, he cites examples of causal loops that he thinks are absurd. And I don't find the examples he cites absurd at all. His strategy is just to sort of give these explanations and say, look, these seem absurd, but they just weren't, it did seem absurd to me whatsoever. Uh, so if you're interested, you should check out the paper. Um, but I just want to point out that if we accept causal loops, we have yet another way to avoid the contingency arguments. And I'm one of those, I guess, weird people who doesn't find causal loops to be problematic. So that's enough about Proust's response now. Um, as I said, I think there are a number of reasons to think that it doesn't work. So let me briefly summarize the preceding section before we move on to the next piece of evidence. So in this section, we examined the LCA, and we first looked at whether a necessary being existing would favor theism over naturalism, and we found that there's no strong reason to believe that it does. Specifically, we examined the argument from limits and found that it was not compelling. Secondly, we pointed out that contingency arguments suffer from one of the two general problems with theistic evidence, which is that they rely on disputed data. They rely on the existence of this necessary being, and there are reasons to doubt that a necessary being exists. So we looked at the general form that arguments for necessary being to take on, and we doubted two parts of them. So first we examined the PSR, and we found that the arguments for the PCR are not decisive. Uh, we looked at appeals to induction, science, and worries about skepticism, and we found that they at best constitute a weak case for the PSR. On the other hand, there are two good arguments against the PSR. Firstly, the existence of a coherent naturalistic 
alternatives that uh, that are worldviews that don't actually require you to uh, believe in a strong PSR that would get you to a necessary being. And secondly, we looked at the modal collapse response and found that alterations to the principle to try and avoid modal collapse failed to be satisfactory for a variety of reasons. Uh, finally, we looked at the idea that there's this global state of affairs that needs explaining, and we found that there are good arguments that global states of affairs like infinite causal sequences do not always need special explanations, which also undercuts uh, our justification for thinking there's a necessary being. So in summary, I doubt that the LCA gets us to uh, the existence of the data that you need to even run the argument, I mean, if you can get to that data, I don't think that data strongly favors theism over naturalism. All right, so we can finally move on to the next section, which is going to be the fine-tuning argument. And here are just some uh, good quotes about the fine-tuning argument that uh, sort of are going to intru introduce some of my thoughts. You can pause the video and read them if you'd like. I'm not going to read them here. So I think most people are familiar with how this argument goes, but I'm just going to briefly summarize it. So uh, the way it goes, it starts with the uh, existence of these highly specific parameters in fundamental physics and particle physics that allow for the existence of life. So there seem to be these constants that are such that if you change them even slightly, you would get a universe that's completely hostile to life. And there are many, many, if you look at the possible range of values that these parameters could have taken on in conjunction with one another, there are many more ways these parameters could have been arranged such for the life that the universe is completely hostile to life than there are ways for these parameters to be arranged such that the universe allows for life. So that's the data. Uh, and then we sort of have two arguments for why theism predicts this data, at least these seem to be the two strongest. The first is just basically an inductive inference from the fundamental nature of theism. So right on theism, reality is fundamentally minded, while on naturalism, reality is fundamentally non-minded. So if you start with a fundamentally minded reality, you have more inductive reason to expect minds to exist than if you start with a fundamentally non-minded reality. Uh, the second argument for why theism predicts this data, which is probably more important, starts with God's omnibenevolence and God being all good. Because if God's all good, then God probably has reasons for valuing life and wanting to create life, uh, both because life is intrinsically good and because there are many goods associated with life existing that God would want to create. Uh, Specifically, it seems pretty compelling to think that an all-loving God would want to enter into relationship with other beings and allow those beings to partake in communion with him, allow those beings to get access to all sorts of goods that come about by existing. So this is the basic reason to expect that you would have uh, finely tuned parameters that allow for life on theism. On the other hand, on naturalism, uh, you basically would want to apply here the principle of indifference, right? Because on naturalism, there's no reason to think that fundamental reality would care about the existence of life. We have no reason to expect that the parameters would be tuned towards the existence of life. They could be tuned towards anything. There's, there's no reason to expect one value over any other value, really. At least that's how, again, the argument goes. Now, let me start with by giving my, my summary, uh, the summary of the thoughts that I have on this argument before I get into the specifics of my responses here. So I'm pretty sympathetic towards fine-tuning arguments. I used to basically think that fine-tuning arguments were evidence for theism and they were just outweighed by other evidence in favor of naturalism. But more recently, I've stopped thinking that fine-tuning arguments are good evidence for theism, and I'll, I'll go into why that is here. I'm always willing to be convinced back the other way, but this is my current position. Uh, now, my, my problems here, my first problem is that the probability judgment in the argument is dubious. I think there are good reasons to doubt both that the probability of the evidence on naturalism is as, is as low as uh, proponents of the argument make it out to be, and that the probability of the evidence on theism is as high as proponents of the argument make it out to be. Secondly, the argument suffers from both problems present in theistic arguments that I identified at the start of this video. Uh, there are minor problems with disputed data, and there are major problems with understated evidence, and I'll get into what those problems are uh, at the end of this section. But let me start with that first problem, that the probability judgment in the argument is dubious. And let's begin by evaluating this assumption that the probability of having fine-tuned parameters is really, really low on naturalism. Now, I sort of briefly touched on this, but let me make it more explicit. Um, proponents of the fine-tuning argument generally assume a uniform distribution for the selection of the constants. What does this mean? This means pick one of these constants or parameters uh, that is supposedly finely tuned for life. Now look at the possible range of values you could take on. What proponents of the argument will say is that out of all the val possible values uh, that this parameter or constant could have taken on, we should assign each one an equal chance to be selected on naturalism. That's sort of what the point of the principal indifference is. Now, is this a reasonable assumption? It seems so initially, but I think there are actually significant reasons to doubt it. Specifically, we know a little something about how distributions in nature work. Uh, we know that distributions in nature are almost always normally distributed, not uniformly distributed. Now, the difference between these two kinds of distributions is shown by the graphs here on the right. So in a uniform distribution, as I mentioned, all the possible values have an equal chance of being selected. 
Uh, on a normal distribution curve, however, the values towards the mean uh, slash median slash mode are much more likely to be selected than values towards uh, the extremes of either side. So if this is the way that the constants were selected by a sort of normal distribution process, then we ought to assume that the values that we observe are the mean values, right? That, that's the most reasonable assumption to make. And so if the life-permitting values are around the mean, well, what, whereas non-life-permitting values are towards the extremes, again, assuming this is a, a distribution representing the possible values that the parameters could take on, then it actually looks a lot more likely than you would have, than you would have thought on a uniform distribution curve that the parameters that we observe would be selected. In other words, parameters that uh, allow for life would be selected on naturalism. So there are two justifications here for thinking that we ought to expect that the constants and parameters would be distributed normally on naturalism rather than distributed uniformly. Uh, that's both, and one is a posteriori, and that's the one I already mentioned, which is our basic observation that this is how values in nature are selected. And then there's also a totally a priori justification from the central limit theorem, which seems to imply that we ought to expect the, these kinds of distributions. So uh, this is a strong reason for thinking that the probability of the uh, values being such that they uh, allow for life is actually a lot higher on naturalism than advocates of the argument have made it out to be. So there is a second reason to think that the evidence on naturalism is not so low, and this is the existence of many versions of naturalism on which the evidence is perfectly expected. So the most famous uh, of these versions of naturalism that's often used in response to the fine-tuning argument is multiverse naturalism. Uh, so here you have many, many different universes, all of which have different values for their fundamental constants. And if this is the kind of naturalism that we have, then it will be inevitable that some of these universes will end up having parameters that allow for life. Now, there are also other versions of naturalism that predict uh, the, the evidence here. And these are things like modal realism, a necessary initial state, though that's disputed whether that would apply in an objective Bayesian sense here, uh, a directed version of naturalism, uh, where there's some sort of um, like teleology uh, or some sort of axiarchism. Though I'm not sure, I, would, I, I might dispute uh, that that actually counts as a version of naturalism, but that's a, a sort of separate topic. Uh, now, the problem with all of these theories is that they require us to specify a specific version of naturalism, which requires us to evaluate the probability that uh, that version of naturalism would be true on uh, sort of bare naturalism. So it's not clear what version of naturalism we ought to assume when evaluating this probability. Um, but while I don't have a reason to regard these extensions to naturalism as very, very likely, I also don't have a reason to favor roll of the dice random naturalism, which is basically the version of naturalism that proponents uh, of the fine-tuning argument want to assume. Right? It's not clear that our default uh, assumption about the way that the constants are selected on naturalism should be that we assume this roll of the dice random naturalism. All of these other versions of naturalism I've talked about, both the normally distributed naturalism, multiverse naturalism, uh, all these versions of naturalism I listed out here, uh, they all seem to me equally likely or more plausible than roll of the dice random naturalism. In fact, some of them seem to have independent justification, like from cosmology, from multiverse naturalism, that ran random roll of the dice naturalism don't have. And uh, so what we ought to do here is apply the law of total probability and say, look, the probability of the evidence on naturalism requires us to take a weighted average of the various uh, versions of naturalism uh, with respect to the selection of the constants. And if we take a weighted average of uh, all these various versions of naturalism, the evidence does not look nearly so low as proponents of the argument from fine tuning want to say it is. It only looks really low if you unshared away saddle naturalists with needing to think uh, that the sort of only plausible version of naturalism is this roll of the dice naturalism. So before I move on, I do want to quickly address a counter that people uh, have recently been giving to multiverse naturalism as a response to the fine-tuning argument. And this has been popularized by philosopher Philip Goff, though it's, been, it's not unique to him. It's been talked about for many years uh, prior to his popularization of it. And this is basically the inverse gambler's fallacy. So this is a fallacy that's said to occur when you assume that because some really, really rare special outcome has occurred, that the process leading to that outcome must have happened many times in the past. So in other words, you walk into the casino and you see uh, the dealer rolled, rolled double sixes and you say, wow, um, well, he, he, he rolled double sixes. So clearly he's been rolling many, many times uh, before that. Um, but obviously that's uh, clearly a, a fallacious kind of inference. Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics of whether or not uh, this fallacy applies to the multiverse, uh, because instead I want to point out that it doesn't even apply in the way that I'm thinking about uh, the problem here. So this would be a fallacy that applies if you inferred from the fact that the parameters and constants that we see are fundamentally tuned towards life, that there is a multiverse, right? If you're making that inference. But the way I'm thinking about it here is, antecedent, is in terms of antecedent probabilities. So I'm thinking about the probability of the evidence on naturalism prior to our observation of the evidence. So we're not using our observation of the evidence to infer 
the, that there is a multiverse, rather asking what's the probability of the evidence on naturalism, where multiverse naturalism is one version of naturalism to consider uh, in conjunction with the various other versions of naturalism in terms of a weighted average uh, that we then use to evaluate the probability. Now, you might say that if we don't use our observation of the finely tuned constants in order to infer that there's a multiverse, then we'll lose our reason for thinking that a multiverse is a particularly likely auxiliary addition to bare naturalism, which then undercuts our ability to use it to significantly dent the fine-tuning argument. And I agree to a certain extent. I don't think that specifying specific versions of naturalism that predict the data fully undercuts the fine-tuning argument. It just dampens a little bit of its evidential force. Uh, but then if you then leverage the law of total probability and say, look, we need to take a weighted average of all these different uh, versions of naturalism, uh, where the, the the weight refers to how, you know, we, we weight it in terms of how plausible each version is, then I do think that that is something that significantly dents the uh, judgment here, because there's no reason to, for instance, regard single universe random roll of the dice naturalism as less plausible than multiverse naturalism antecedently. Uh, in fact, there are arguably independent supports for multiverse naturalism that don't exist for this random uh, roll of the dice version of naturalism, like cosmology and other theoretical and philosophical considerations. So in conclusion, the existence of these versions of naturalism that predict D, this isn't going to fully undercut the probability judgment here, in my opinion, but it does uh, pose a problem uh, for the strength of the judgment here that theists are going to want to say is really, really strong. I'm going to say it's not so strong. So next, I want to talk about the probability of the evidence on theism and the assumption that this is high or at least higher than the probability of the evidence on naturalism. I think this is an even more problematic assumption uh, than the assumption that the probability of the evidence on naturalism is really low. So why should we think that the probability of the evidence on theism is not high? Well, first of all, recall that God cares about life, not the constants looking a particular way, right? God cares about the constants insofar as they allow for this thing he really values, namely life. He doesn't care about certain parameters in physics looking a certain way in terms of what number they are. Uh, so this is going to create problems when we realize that there are many ways God could get life without finally tuning the constants, right? God doesn't need to have the constants set at particular values to get life. He can get life without these constants being those values. So for instance, God could miraculously sustain life under hostile conditions. He could create a universe that's completely hostile to life in terms of the physical constants, but via a series of miracles, sustain life within that universe. He could create disembodied life that exists in the spiritual realm or completely non-physical realm without any physical instantiation whatsoever. Finally, God could alter the psychophysical laws, which are basically the laws about what kinds of configurations of matter or physical states can be endowed with consciousness or complex psychological states. Right? So in our current universe, there are clearly certain forms of matter, like uh, the chunk of matter that makes up myself or the chunk of matter that makes up you, that can exist uh, uh, and have consciousness. However, if you change the constants, you're going to get very, very different physical states. But who's to say that God couldn't make it such that those physical states could have morally valuable uh, psychological states imb imbued with them? This sounds like a really weird possibility, but God's all-powerful, and theists are committed to the idea uh, that there are states you know, that are utterly different than our own that can be down with consciousness, right? It, it, theists think that God exists and is totally non-physical and yet can have these psychological states. So clearly theists aren't committed to this idea uh, that psychological states must be in this particular rigid uh, physical formulation. In fact, this is a very uh, unpopular view in the philosophy of mind to think this. So as long as you think that the psychophysical laws are contingent and that alternative configurations of matter that are very different from our own could be down with consciousness, then irrespective of what the constants are, God can get morally valuable life. He can just endow whatever physical states happen to exist in these alternative universes with life. There's an excellent paper that I would recommend that sort of gives this argument. Uh, it's by Neil Sinhababu. Hope I didn't butcher that name. It's called Electrons in Love. And he, he gives these very sort of sci-fi-esque cool scenarios where, for instance, seas of electrons could fall in love or, or have these really interesting psychological interactions. And now, if that seems weird to you, again, it's because we're in this universe with the current set of psychophysical laws we have here. But God's all-powerful, and he can change the psychophysical laws to be whatever he wants. And in fact, if you uh, agree with this assumption, then it turns out the range of possibilities would be actually greater on theism than on naturalism. Because remember that earlier, uh, theists were going to want to say that, look, we should apply the principle of indifference in order to figure out what the probability distribution is for getting the constants on naturalism. But now, since we know that God can get what he wants, irrespective of what the constants look like, then when it comes to what we should expect about the constants on theism, since we have no reason now to think that God would favor any particular set of constants over any other, since they all uh, would 
are compatible with the existence of life, then we ought to assume uniform distribution for which constants God selects. But that means that we also get this ridiculous, ridiculously low probability for the evidence on theism. Uh, so this uh, is actually really, really bad uh, for the fine-tuning argument if if, if this uh, counter goes through. And in fact, the, the range is greater because on theism, you have not only all the physical possibilities, but you also have the non-physical possibilities uh, for the existence of life, like spiritual realms or angelic realms or the miraculous sustaining of life under hostile conditions, all of which uh, don't exist on naturalism. So I think this is a really uh, important uh, counter that theists are going to need to address to get the fine-tuning argument to work. Now, one possible counter you can give here that I've seen uh, Philip Goff give is that you say the psychophysical laws are in the background when we make this judgment. Uh, so basically, when we're making this judgment in the background evidence that you're conjoining with both theism and naturalism, we already set the fact that the psychophysical laws are the way that they are. So uh, given the, that the psychophysical laws are such that only uh, you know, the sort of constants we observe now would allow for life, God would clearly sort of pick the constants that we observe now, whereas we have no reason to expect that on naturalism. That's the sort of gist of this response. Uh, and if you don't understand that and what background evidence is, uh, I'll try and explain it elsewhere. It's a bit too complicated to get, to get into here, uh, but I have covered it in other places on my blog, and I'll link that in the description. Now, three problems with this response. Uh, first of all, we don't know what the full extent of the psychophysical laws are, right? In other words, the psychophysical laws could be a lot more exotic uh, than we know now. Uh, you know, we, we have this observation of carbon-based life, but we really don't know what the full extent uh, of the possibilities for life is. It could be that there are many different uh, sort of wild configurations of physical states that allow for life that we simply aren't aware of. Secondly, what the physical psychophysical laws are is disputed. So what exactly to put in the background is unclear, right? Because uh, according to me and most naturalists and most physicalists, uh, the psychophysical laws are such that the only kind of life that can exist is physical. Uh, so God couldn't exist at all. Now clearly theists can't put that in the background. So what exactly to pick here for the background evidence uh, is in dispute. And thirdly, most importantly, this just pushes the improbability back, right? If you're shoving the, the psychophysical laws in the background, that's fine. But then the question is, well, what's the probability that God would pick this particular conjunction of psychophysical laws and then physical laws? Uh, and when you ask that question, then the probability look, looks extraordinarily uh, small on theism. So uh, you can't just arbitrarily uh, set the background exactly how you'd like it to make the, the judgment come out in favor of theism, because when you end up considering why God would choose these particular psychophysical laws that constrain him to this kind of physical universe, that's where the, uh, the probability looks really bad for theism. So next up, I'm going to apply the two general problems I identified with theistic arguments at the beginning of this video to the fine-tuning argument. Uh, now, as I mentioned, I think fine-tuning has some minor problems with disputed data and then some very significant problems with understated evidence. And I'll begin with uh, the disputed data uh, part. So in general, I don't have reason to dispute that the scientific data behind fine-tuning is on good ground. As far as I've seen, uh, the advocates of fine-tuning are right about the existence of these parameters and the fact that if you change these parameters, the physical universe uh, looks very, very different in ways that probably wouldn't be conducive to life. But there are a few caveats worth noting. Uh, first of all, we don't know what the, all the possible variations of the constants look like. I could be corrected on this, but as far as when I looked into it, it seems like people have not done all the simulations to know if you change multiple parameters at once, uh, what are all the different physical, physical configurations we get going to look like. Right? It's easy to just take one parameter and say, if you change this one parameter by a little bit, this is how things will look. But you have many, many parameters, so you have a, uh, an n-dimensional, multi-dimensional space of possibilities to look at, and it's just not feasible to look at all the different possibilities that, that you could possibly do by altering all these parameters in tandem with one another. Uh, so that, that's one concern. The second concern is we simply don't know what the conditions are that are necessary for life, right? We're operating on a very small sample size here. Uh, we have our own sample size of carbon-based life. Clearly life can exist in this form, but I think it's, it's plausible to think that the uh, sort of physical states that could be endowed with life are a lot more exotic uh, than we think they are. I already sort of mentioned this already, actually, when responding to uh, an objection to the previous section, but uh, there doesn't seem to be reason to think that the, the ways that life could exist are totally restricted to the kind of life we observe now. There could be all sorts of weird physical states that, that could have complex psychological states and morally valuable life that we simply don't know about. Now, uh, I do want to stress that I don't think either of these concerns uh, means the fine-tuning argument fails or, or even dents the force of the argument significantly. I do think that they make the data slightly more questionable than one would want, right? It's not completely solid data, it's slightly disputed. But again, I don't think this fully undercuts the argument, I just think it's worth mentioning. Now, what I do think is a extremely significant uh, barrier to the fine-tuning argument is this problem of understated evidence that I talked about at the beginning of the video. Uh, 
Uh, so remember, understated evidence is when you focus on some general facts supporting your hypothesis, but you ignore some more specific facts about that general fact that strongly cut against your hypothesis. And the problem here is that the mere fact that the universe allows for life is a very, very general and broad fact. Sure enough, that might uh, support theism over naturalism. But more specific facts about the quality, nature, and extent of that life strongly cut against theism. We actually already talked about a few of these in the previous part of the series, right? Life is extremely unimpressive. It's highly limited in all sorts of ways that I elaborated on more extensively earlier. Uh, also, life is highly dependent on physical mechanisms. Life has evolved via evolutionary processes. Uh, and all of these facts, for reasons we've already discussed, uh, significantly favor naturalism over theism. Additionally, the universe is not teeming with life, right? If life is highly morally valuable, and in fact the reason God is setting the constants the way they are is for the existence of life, then uh, surely we would expect uh, that life would be much more plentiful in the universe than it is. On the other hand, on naturalism, we have no reason to expect that the universe would be teeming with life. So the fact that there isn't lots of life is another fact that is more specific and yet is less likely on theism. Thirdly, the universe is more tuned towards the production of non-moral rather than moral agents. Uh, what do I mean here? Well, uh, think about the fact that the most rudimentary forms of life that seem to begin to exist, for instance, on our planet, are, are very, very basic forms of life that have no uh, moral characteristics or moral value, or at least a very insignificant moral value, right? Uh, forms of life like insects or uh, even unicellular or multicellular organisms at the microscopic level are the kinds of life that really uh, have the kind of value that you expect God to care about. Yet it seems that our universe is much more set up to produce this kind of life than the existence of moral agents, right? To get to moral agents such as ourselves, uh, you have to go through this complex evolutionary process that has all these barriers and all these ways it can go wrong, right? Just in the evolution of our own planet, there are so many steps at which uh, life could have just been wiped out permanently and we never would have gone into the stage where you have uh, human-like life. Now, if theism is true, then surely we would expect that the universe would be most weighted towards the production of moral agents, right? After all, the, the, the extent to which God cares about life, clearly he has far more reason to care about moral agents. I mean, arguably, he has no reason to care about completely non-moral agents uh, like, you know, uh, microscopic organisms that just have no uh, moral worth or no ability to have any kind of psychological state uh, whatsoever. So the fact that the universe is much more set up to be uh, to, to produce non-moral agents rather than moral agents, at least as far as we know, is another specific fact that is much less likely on theism and much more likely on naturalism. And by the way, Justin Schieber from Relay Theology is the one who made this point to me, so credit to him for this particular point, which I thought is quite a good one. Now, the final point I want to make is that the universe is really, really hostile to life, and we are really, really insignificant uh, in our place in the universe. If you look up you know, videos or or articles that talk about how vast the universe is in comparison to us, you'll be shocked by how we are just a tiny, tiny microscopic speck in the in the vast cosmos. And we have no way to even, in principle, have access to or know about the vast majority of it. Uh, so it's just completely inaccessible to us, even within our local reference frame. Uh, traveling at all or traversing the universe in any way is extremely challenging, and it's, it's, it's almost guaranteed that we're never going to really break out uh, of our own tiny local corner of the cosmos. So initially, it seems kind of unexpected on theism, right? Because on theism, if, if God's finally tuning the constants to allow for this really morally significant thing that is life, uh, surely you would expect that God would want uh, that life to have access to the cosmos, right? To be able to appreciate the goods therein and actually uh, traverse the cosmos in some way and play some kind of significant role in the cosmos. Uh, since God has reason to favor life, whereas on naturalism, uh, the universe is completely indifferent to the existence of life. However, I've become a little bit skeptical of the ability to make this argument because there are easy ways to generate counter considerations for why God wouldn't want life to play a significant role in the universe. You could say, for instance, that by having life play this very insignificant role, God is emphasizing sort of the mystery and beauty of creation. He's putting humans in awe uh, of, of, cre of creation. So our ability to make predictions here is a little bit muddy. Now, I'd argue that's sort of a bug of theism, but it, it makes these very vague predictions. But I just want to point out two things. First of all, even if the uh, probability judgment here on theism is muddy. In other words, you can generate considerations for God making life insignificant and considerations against God life making insignificant. Uh, the probability judgment for naturalism looks a lot more solid because since reality is fundamentally indifferent, we have reason to expect that life will also uh, life will also be insignificant in the face of the universe because uh, the universe doesn't care about life. So it has no reason to make life play a especially significant role in the universe. And with a uh, properly specified 
background evidence, uh, there are far more configurations by which the universe uh, would be really, really hostile to life and life would be really insignificant uh, relative to the universe than there are configurations where life would play a prominent role within the universe. Second of all, if you go for this sort of route of saying that the reason that God makes the universe so hostile is to put uh, life in awe and creation, in awe of God's creation and in awe of like the mystery of the universe, then you undercut a counter to an earlier argument that I made in this section. Because right? earlier I said, look, one of the possibilities that God has that doesn't require him fine-tuning the universe is to miraculously sustain life under hostile conditions. Well, if God's purpose is to make the universe, to put people in awe of the universe and, and sort of put, awe, put them in awe of the majesty of creation, that would be a even better way of putting life in awe of creation than simply placing uh, people at in an insignificant role of the universe, right? Imagine we are in a universe where uh, not only are, do we play an insignificant role, but in fact, we're constantly being miraculously sustained. That would be a universe that would be even more, uh, even more beautiful, even more uh, bizarre and shocking. So the fact is that if God's trying to tune the universe towards uh, putting us in awe of it and, and painting this mystery around it, he hasn't actually done a great job. It, the fact that there's so much uh, extra cosmos out there is certainly interesting, and it, it puts us in a bit of awe, uh, but it, awe is not maximized. And again, with theism, you expect uh, God, since he is all good, all powerful, to maximize these things. Uh, so the predictions here are just a little bit muddy. I also want to point out that uh, there is one sense in which I think the universe is uh, sort of very hostile to life that is really unexpected on theism, and I don't think there is such a good uh, counter for or uh, a way to make the probability judgment muddy. And that's in the case of the initial evolution of the universe. So it took 400,000 years before the first elements were formed in, in the universe. If you look at the initial state of the universe, it was just complete lifelessness everywhere with hardly any activity going on everywhere, any significant activity. So there's just basically nothing going on for hundreds of thousands of years before even the most rudimentary, uh, you know, building blocks needed to, to make uh, anything significant formed, let alone before the first planets formed. Now, what's the reason for this extremely long state of lifelessness where there's just no anim animated activity going on whatsoever? Uh, well, on naturalism, we have definitely have no reason not to expect this, right? Uh, on naturalism, the universe is not uh, in any way especially weighted towards the creation of these uh, morally significant states. But on theism, what's the good in the state of lifelessness? It seems completely uh, useless. It's not even contributing significantly to our awe. It's not as if there was a, this was a particularly interesting or beautiful creation process. It's just a state of really, really long, boring lifelessness. So this seems really ex unexpected on uh, theism. Now, of course, you could say maybe there's some unknown good that God has in having this really long state of lifelessness. But of course, there could be some unknown bad uh, that exists in this really, or that's caused by this uh, really long state of lifelessness. So the unknowns uh, cut in both directions here. Uh, so as far as I can tell, the fact that you have this extremely long state of lifelessness is much more expected on naturalism and theism. And it's yet another way that the fine tuning evidence is understated. Okay, so just as a sort of end to the section, a wrap up to the section, I just want to talk about one possible way to adjust the fine tuning argument that I think is kind of interesting. Because again, I have intuitive sympathy for these kind of arguments, so I'm open to some other format working. Uh, so one idea would be to focus on the intelligibility of science and order in the universe. So in other words, instead of saying that God is finding, finally tuning the constants to allow for the existence of life, you say he's finally tuning the constants because this allows for the intelligibility of what's going on around us. It allows for a sort of order and coherence in us being able to discover what's going on in the universe. Uh, and the idea here is that you may be able to rule out some of the ways fine-tuning also looks, looks unexpected on theism, right? Those possibilities about miraculous sustaining of life under hostile conditions or psychophysical laws being altered, that might uh, go away as an issue. Uh, so I think this is a, an interesting kind of alteration. There are still some problems. First of all, it's not obvious that it actually avoids these situations, right? It's not clear uh, that you couldn't have some kind of intelligibility or coherence under these very uh, different physical configurations, especially given that God is all powerful and he has the ability to perform miracles. It's also way less obvious that God cares about this as that he cares about life. I think the move from God being all good to God caring about the existence of morally relevant life or wanting to form a relationship with other life forms is a lot stronger than the move from God being all good to God caring about uh, general intelligibility of science. And finally, uh, you still run into problems with understated evidence, uh, just that the evidence becomes understated in other ways. We then need to ask, look, if what God cares about is this intelligibility and order, are we in a universe uh, where uh, the scientific enterprise actually does have access uh, to all the fundamental uh, parts of the universe, right? Uh, is science fully intelligible? Are we, are we the sort of creatures that can fully grasp science and can science reveal uh, 
what, what can science reveal, can actually reveal the full extent uh, of what's going on in the universe. And I think there are ways in which that is also understated that Paul Draper has talked about. Uh, there's actually an excellent debate between Robin Collins and Paul Draper where he he talks about this exact version of the fine-tuning argument and I think gives some pretty good responses. Uh, I, I couldn't find the link for it recently. It seems to have gone off the web, but if I can find it, I'll post it in the description. Uh, so again, I'm not going to talk about this extension significantly, but I do think it's an interesting sort of idea. So as a summary of the fine-tuning argument, I do have sympathy for the general just behind these arguments. It does strike me in some sense that the general fact that there is orderliness and life in the universe fits better with theism than naturalism. Uh, however, I no longer buy the specifics that you need to make this argument work. First of all, the probability of the evidence on naturalism is not nearly so low as advocates of the fine-tuning argument make it out to be. First of all, the principle of indifference does not clearly apply because, as I already talked about, the assumptions that we should actually make about the probability of evidence on naturalism look far better for naturalism because we have reason to think that the constants would be selected via a normal distribution rather than a uniform distribution. Secondly, there are many versions of naturalism that actually directly entail or predict the uh, e being the, the constants being finely tuned. And so if we take a weighted average of all the versions uh, of naturalism, we would not get such a low probability judgment as the advocates of the fine-tuning argument want to suppose. Secondly, the probability of the evidence on theism is really problematic because there are strong reasons to think that it's just as, as low as the probability of the evidence on naturalism because it's not clear that in order to get the thing that God cares about, life, God needs to set the constants in a particular way. In fact, it seems like there are many possibilities under which you can have life under very, very different values for the constants that are perfectly compatible with theism. Finally, fine-tuning succumbs to both of the general issues that I identify with theistic arguments earlier. There are some slight problems with the data being disputed, but there are really major problems with understated evidence. All the specifics about life in our universe point strongly against theism and strongly towards naturalism. If you focus on this very general fact that life exists, sure enough, that might be more probable on theism than naturalism. But then the second that you look into the specifics of that life, the fact that it's highly dependent on physical mechanisms, the fact that it's so unimpressive and limited and uh, flawed in so many different ways, the fact that it evolved via this very long, tortuous physical evolutionary process, uh, the fact that the universe is not teeming with life whatsoever, uh, the fact that uh, the universe is highly insignificant, uh, or, excuse me, the fact that there is this long state of lifelessness at the beginning of the, of the universe and then life plays this highly insignificant role in the universe. The fact that the universe is much more tuned towards the production of non-moral agents that God wouldn't care about as compared to moral agents that God would care about. When you consider all these facts uh, and you look into the specifics of, specifics of the evidence, the uh, evidence starts to weight towards naturalism and away from theism. So these are the reasons I think the fine-tuning argument is not very compelling. Okay, so before closing out this video, I just want to talk about the next video in the series. So the next video will be the second part in the section of the series that covers evidence taken to favor theism, and I'll examine four more pieces of evidence that are taken to favor theism. Consciousness, moral knowledge, beauty, and religious experience. I'm pretty sure I won't have to do a third video in this uh, part of the series because these two facts took a lot longer to cover than I think these next four will, just because they're much uh, more commonly discussed arguments that I had more to say about. Uh, and of course, my conclusions will be similar to those in this video, which is that while I admit that some of these facts, when they're stated very generally, may favor theism, they all rely on these issues with theistic evidence I identified, which is that they depend on disputed data or seriously understated evidence or a combination of the two. Now, I'm not sure how long this one will take to get out, but hopefully not too much, not as long as the break was between this video and the previous one. I again apologize for that. Just so much came up. I know it took longer than even I said when I updated you all. Uh, so again, uh, I apologize for, uh, apologize for that. Uh, but please, if you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. Please leave any comments that you have with criticisms or suggestions, ideas, etc. Uh, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.